Hey everyone, a little bit of a different view today. I had the case all ripped up because I was uh, moving some modules around. I, I've got some new things coming in that I wanted to fit. And I figured while well, I've got all of the modules out of it, I should talk about the actual DIY case that I have here, which I completed this last year. All right, so first of all, <laughs> moment of honesty here. This is actually my second attempt at a DIY case. The first time I started this was kind of late late 2018, early 2019. I ordered a bunch of parts and I took a shot at it and it was it was a little bit of a disaster. It kind of kind of just didn't really go where I wanted it to go. I learned some things in that process um, that I'll share with you now and those things informed the creation of this case. There was, really, there was really three things that I think I learned in my first attempt at building a case. And the first is that the hardware matters, especially the rail hardware. Um, on, my, on my very first attempt, I, I won't say the company, but I purchased rails from, from a company that sort of advertises themselves as being a, a cheaper alternative to the, the DIY crowd. And um, they just, they, they, weren't very, they weren't very high quality. The biggest issue that I had is that the the width of the rails were not all the same. So I had ordered a set. I was going to build a 9U case, which is three rails. That means that I had, sorry, three rows, which means that I had six, six different rails. And when I lined them all up together and, and put them all sort of side by side, it was just, it was just like ragged edge on one end. They were all just slightly different. The total amount of difference from the shortest to the longest was about a sixteenth of an inch. And uh, maybe for what you're doing, that doesn't matter, but it just, it really bothered me and it, it, it made sort of the, the overall frame of it a little bit inconsistent. So I learned, I learned to pay for quality rails when I built my second case, which is this one here. And again, I'll talk later, I'm going to be building a, another case. Um, when I did so, I, I switched on my second attempt and I went with tip top Z rails and I have pretty much exclusively used tip top Z rails uh, ever since I had it in my first tip top mantis case. I got a second mantis case. It's now here in this case. And then I'm going to be building another case here for 2021 and I'm using them there. Um, they're a little bit more expensive, but the quality that you get is just top notch. They are every single time I've gotten them, they've been exactly the same width. The, the uh, threaded nut strip that's inside of here is always exactly the width that you need. It's not loose and rattling around. And I really feel that Z rails are worth the couple of extra dollars that you spend for them. The second thing that I learned, and maybe this is kind of obvious if you've ever taken on a big project before, is if you're going to build your own case, you need to design it within the constraints of the skill and the time and the tools that you have. And I can't, I can't blame my first failure on just the rails not really lining up. I had designed a very fancy case. It had a lot of fancy features. I was doing side entry for the power and it just, there was a lot of stuff that just made it really a huge time sink and it was a little bit beyond where I was at. When you're thinking about building your own case, one thing to take inventory of is how much time do you have to spend on this, you know, per day or per weekend? What kind of tools do you have at your disposal? what previous building experience that you have. And you want to make sure that you design within the constraints of that. You don't want to, you don't want to have something really fancy and really go for a craftsman grade project if you are brand new to woodworking. All right, and the last thing that I learned in my first project before we talk about my current case here is it, it's a lot easier to design a case if you already have bought the rails and you already have bought your power solution. Being able to design your case and your dimensions around the the hardware and the power that you have on in, in your hands will make things quite a lot easier. It's a little tricky if you've never built one before to sort of conceptualize and think about how it's all going to go together when you don't have it. And when you have it, you can actually start laying things out and you can see how, how does this fit in the space that I'm thinking it's going to fit. I, I started this process with sketching. The first time I did this, I was just sketching, and then I, I did some fancy computer design. And what I found is at the end of the day, it was just it was much easier to, to have the rails and, and to have the power and to sort of just design what I was going to do around that. Now, one sort of sub-lesson in this lesson is that also saves you the problem of not being able to get the thing that you need. 
So when I had started this, this was my second attempt, I already had the power boards and the rails, but the IntelliGel front power entry panels were still out of stock. And so I had started building and I basically finished this whole, this whole case, the wood and most of the, the rest of it uh, early in 2020, but I had to wait for IntelliGel to get these back in stock, which, which took a couple of months. So that's another thing that gives you the advantage. If, if you get all of your pieces up front before you kind of start designing the case and building it, then you actually know that you have the pieces that you need to finish, which is, it's kind of important. Okay, so let's jump in now from sort of lessons learned to what I actually did on this case. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few aspects here. I want to talk about construction, uh, how, how to actually, you know, do the woodworking to assemble this. I want to talk a little bit about power. I want to talk about some design considerations and mounting. And then lastly, I'll talk about features of this case and things that you might want to consider in your own builds. All right, so in terms of construction, uh, a little bit of a confession here. When I was in my late 20s and early 30s, I, I did a lot more woodworking. That was before I had kids. I had a lot more time on my hands. So um, kind of coming into building my own case, I already had some woodworking skill, and I had a lot of the tools still available to me. Now, for this particular case, uh, I'll show you in a second, it has a matching lid that sort of clicks. Uh, what I really wanted to do at the start is I wanted something that was portable, and I wanted to build it myself. Now, to build this, I used primarily three tools. I used a table saw, a Festool domino, and a drill press. Those are fancy tools, and they have some costs associated with them. If you're just getting into this, uh, most of what I'm going to show you could also be built with a circular saw, a pocket hole jig, and a handheld drill. So if you've never seen pocket screws before, I have a little bit of an example. This is kind of awkward because it's it's inside of the case. Let's see if I can angle it here. So if you can look right here, you can see that there's this, this little hole. Um, what's actually happening here, the way that pocket screws work is you, you use a jig and the jig, the jig causes a hole to be drilled at an angle that, that's, that's like this, like what I'm doing with my hand. The reason why that actually turns out to be fairly effective uh, without getting into a lot of woodworking theory, is if you just put the screws in straight like this, think about the way this screw is grabbing this material. At most, you're only grabbing two of the plies in the middle, and you're only grabbing a teeny tiny amount of them. The Putting the screws in straight from the outside and going straight through is, you know, it works, but it's going to be one of the weaker joints. By putting it in at an angle, you actually cut through a lot of the grains or a lot of the plies of the wood, and that gives you a much stronger joint. Now, a circular saw will probably cost you about 100 bucks for a decent one. Uh, you can certainly find them cheaper, especially if you go used. A pocket hole jig is going to allow you to do a lot more controlled joinery. And the nice thing about a pocket hole jig, not only is it relatively inexpensive, it's about 40 bucks for an entry model, um, you, can, you can take the screws out and you can make changes. So it's it's very forgiving in that if you make a mistake, it's not like glue or it's not like you've permanently drilled something that's visible. It's very easy to take out the screw and, and to fix it. I, I actually have an example of that I'll show you here in a second. And then lastly, of course, you probably already have a handheld drill because it's useful for building IKEA furniture and hanging things on the wall. Now the material that I used for my construction, I went with half inch cabinet grade birch plywood. So if you've never done a lot of woodworking projects and you've never bought a lot of wood, there are basically two kinds of wood out there. You can go with solid wood or you can go with manufactured wood. So solid wood is literally they cut down a tree and made boards from that tree and, and you go and you buy that. Uh, the really, really sort of nice high-end your rack cases are going to be built out of solid wood. If you're building something portable or if you don't want to build something that's incredibly heavy, plywood is a good option. Another thing about uh, plywood here, plywood's a manufactured wood. Another good thing about plywood is it's going to be what's called dimensionally stable. So if you go with solid wood, it takes a little bit of skill to know how that wood is going to breathe and move as the humidity and temperature change over time. And the nice thing is if you go with plywood, not only is it lighter, it's going to be a lot more dimensionally stable. It's much easier to work with. So if this is your very first project, I would highly recommend going with plywood. Now, when you buy plywood, it comes in a couple of different grades. Generally, you want to pay a few more dollars to get a nice cabinet grade. And there's primarily two ways that you can tell if it's going to be a decent quality plywood or not. And the first is the number of plies. So that is, 
If you look here on the edge of this board, you can see it looks like alternating light, dark, light, dark layers stacked up. You can kind of see that all the way around. The quantity of how many of those stacks there are, they're called plies, by the way. The quantity of plies really dictates how good that is. The second thing you want to look for is look at the edge and see if there's gaps or voids in the ply. Cheaper plywood will typically have fatter and fewer plies, and there will be gaps in between it. Now, if you're going to build a nice euro rock case, especially if it's going to be this form where sort of the plywood plies are facing up at you and you have to stare at it while you're working on something, uh, you want to save, you want to not save a couple of dollars. You, you want to spend a little extra and, and get some decent quality plywood. You're going to be much happier with that in the end. Now, the thickness of it is, is up to you. Um, my recommendation would be if you're going to go with a pocket hole jig, which is what I had recommended if, you, if you're new to this, you probably want to go with three quarters of an inch. Uh, if, if you're not, if you're going to do more of a glued or traditional joinery construction, then half inch is fine. Half inch is enough material to have a nice solid case, and uh, the advantage is it's a little bit lighter. Now I'm going to show you one neat little thing that I did here. You can see I've brought up the side cam. I mentioned uh, that I used the Festool Domino. I, I went a little fancy, and you can see here on the ends that there's this darker part that, that is uh, sort of mixed in with the lighter wood. You can see it kind of extending all the way around. What those are is they're called loose tenons, and the Festool Domino is a tool that allows you to perfectly cut that hole, and then you can insert these kind of oblong pegs in there. Um, that's fancy, and I did that because I had access to that. It it certainly makes this a lot, a lot more dimensionally stable. A lot more, it's it's got a lot more structure to it that prevents racking. Uh, you don't have to do that. If you go with a um, pocket hole jig, it'll it'll just be blank over here, which which will give you a nice clean look. Okay, so here are some tips about the actual construction. Um, tip number one is use gauging instead of measuring wherever possible. So what's the difference? To measure is to use a tape measure, you know, and you pull out the tape measure and, and you, you sort of count the ticks that you want and then you use a pencil and you make a little line. Measuring will generally introduce error and if you, if you measure a lot, then you'll keep accumulating error over and over. Every time you measure, there's, there's a little bit of precision that you lose by using the measuring tape. And then when you make the mark, you're losing precision. And then when you cut, if you're not exactly on that, you're losing precision. And so all those things kind of add up. The opposite of measuring is what's called gauging. And so, for example, when I was building this, one of the things that I did is, is I got out these rails, and, and I'll talk about these cheeks here in a second, and I built the cheeks on the end of them, so I sort of had this assembled 3 you row. And I put that down on the wood, and that was what I used to know how wide of a panel should I make for my case. Now, that's called gauging. Instead of, instead of taking a measurement of the rails and saying, okay, they're you know, 24.638 inches long, instead of doing that, I just took the actual rail and I set it down on the wood and I made a line exactly where it was. That, that way I knew that it was going to be exactly what I wanted and I didn't have to deal with fractions or measurements or introduce error. If you do that, if you gauge more than you measure as much as possible, you have a much higher chance of having a precision sort of exact measurement box when you're done. Another just general woodworking tip is if, if you're going to do some kind of setup, like you're going to maybe set up a little fence, or you're going to set up some measurements, you're, you're going to do that, and you know that you're going to need multiple parts of the same width, you want to cut those at the same time. That's kind of a basic machining tip in general, but it can especially matter if you're new to woodworking and you're just sort of getting your feet wet here. It's, it's much easier to, to cut all of the pieces of the same width at the exact same time using the same setup. You have a much higher chance of getting exactly the same size when all is said and done. Now I haven't yet talked about it, but let me get out the lid. One of my goals with this project is that I wanted a portable case. So this probably will look a little funny on the video, but there you can see I got a lid. And uh, I'll talk about this hardware in a second, but if, if you're planning to build a lid, there's a couple of things you should know. One is that the lid will add a lot of complication to your project. Um, if, if this is your first go, I would recommend not building something with a lid. Maybe save a lid for your second go. If you're going to do a lid or if you want to do it on your first try, uh, what I would recommend doing is building, building this whole thing as one sealed box. And then after the sealed box is built, then using your circular saw or table saw to cut the separation between your base and your lid. 
The reason why is the demand to get the lid exactly the same size and proportions to snugly fit on the base, that is very demanding. And even though I was using a fairly fairly nice uh, hybrid cabinet table saw, I, I built mine separately and you can see that it's, it's, not, it's not exactly a perfect alignment. Not only is it an issue of getting the dimensions correct, but it's also an issue of getting the squareness of it correct. Uh, even, even subtle changes in, in how square the lid actually is relative to how square the base is can make it where it doesn't, it doesn't quite line up and your, your latches don't seat properly. So if you're going to do a lid, I would recommend build a, build a complete cube, build a, a box, like a sealed box first, and then cut it to get your lid. All right, so one, one last construction tip here which I think can help you get a lot more precision when you're doing the building. And that is when you think about how the box goes together, you can see here there's, there's two ways that this overlapping of the corners can happen. You can either have the, the end panels sort of fit in and have the bottom piece go under, or you can have the end panels cap the end and the bottom piece lines up. And so you can see here, I would recommend doing what I did, which is use the assembled width of your rails to know exactly how wide this piece should be and that way you know that the width of your box is exactly what it needs to be and then just add on this end cap to account for whatever the thickness is here now one thing you'll learn if you haven't done a lot of woodworking is wood isn't always exactly the, the dimension that you expect it to be so even though this is sold this particular piece is sold as half inch plywood it actually is not exactly half an inch and so here again is one of those, if you choose to gauge rather than to measure, you don't have to worry about those irregularities. I think it's, it's just going to be a lot easier to make this main bottom panel the same width as your rails plus your cheeks.